The problems that we are dealing with in this How to Cope series are the problems of our country. The Lord spoke to me on an airplane and said, you can walk into any airport, look into the bookstore, and there are dozens of books there on uh, how to build a house, uh, how to plant, how to sow, how to cook, and you just get blurry-eyed looking at all the things that they could teach you how to do. And the Lord said, somebody better teach them how to live. And I said, see, that sounds all right. He says, well, get it busy and do it then. So I began on these. I don't want to frighten you, but we've done 96 of them. And so there's a lot of them. Man has a lot of problems. And we want you to find a solution to problems. And not only to find a solution to your problem, we want you to find a solution to your wife's problem. That went over great, didn't it? We want you to find a solution to your neighbor's problems. We want you to find a solution to your, your neighbor's children's problems. It broke the fence for you. Are you still here? We only began last week, so if you don't have your, uh, your, your teaching syllabus, how many brought yours today? Hold it up. Hey, that's a lot of them. Oh, my goodness. Hope, hope our cameras saw that. All right. If you don't have yours, get it. And let's work on it. We have already dealt with how to deal with, how to cope with unbelief. Unbelief is a monster. Unbelief is a killer. Unbeliever is anti-spiritual. Unbelief will take you to hell. And there are a lot of so-called Pentecostal people that are loaded with it. Their little house is a fortress of unbelief. Can't even get into the thing. Got the windows nailed down. They're determined not to believe and make fun of those that do believe. I know of people right now, very intimate with me, that, that fought the healing revival, you know, 25, 30 years ago, and they've been sick ever since, and the Lord won't let them die. Just keeps rubbing and getting in. Says, you fought it, didn't you? Are you here? Oh, I mean it. I could name them for you. And, 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 and there'll be people begging for money to meet their bills because they've, they, they fought prosperity. If you don't want prosperity, I'll take it, bless God. I'll take a double dose of anything good. That went over hilarious, didn't it? Anyway, we're at the second stage here, how to cope with a passive mind. We need a long time for this, and this will be an introduction to it. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, Gird up the loins of your mind. I doubt that anybody watching me right now has done it. Are you listening? I doubt that anybody's done it. God didn't say he was going to do it, and most of us are waiting God to do everything that's done for us. Well, God, why don't you do it? Because it's your job, and you've got to do it if it ever gets done. In the old time when they wore those longer skirts, you know, and they wanted to run, they had to pick the thing up and tie the belt tight where they could get the legs going. So God says, gird up the loins of your mind. If you don't tighten up your mind, the devil will do it for you. And if you let your mind run screwy, the devil will help you do it. If you don't make your mind conform to what God wants it to be, It'll never be that way. And you can't blame it on anybody but yourself. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Not talking about alcoholism. Talking about your stupidity. There's some people so full of silly jokes until that's all they do when they get around you. Tell one right after the other. You know, I, I must not be on the right subject this morning. Something's wrong with you. There's a lot more in life than silliness. There's a lot more fun in life than jokes with two meanings to them, smarty. It says, be, be, be sober. Hope to the end. Did you know there are a lot of people today that have lost their hope? They've slipped backwards. 
They looked around them and they saw this wrong and that wrong and the other wrong. They began to blame God for it. If every one of my class goes home and dies, I'll preach all your funerals free. I'm a good man, you see. And next Sunday morning, I'll preach on healing. For the simple reason, your living or dying has nothing to do with my doctrine. You better get that because you ain't saved, he might die. What happens to you, what happens to me has nothing to do with truth. Truth is truth. And you live by truth. You don't live by conditions. If you live by conditions, the devil will see that you get enough of them to ruin your faith. But if you live by the word of God, you live. Glory be to God forever. You live. If I don't get going, we'll never get to this. There are four primary actions of the human mind. By the mind, man thinks. By the mind, man imagines. By the mind, man learns and comes into knowledge. By man, man understands situations and conditions and the world that's around about him. His mind distinguishes man from all other creatures on this earth. Man's mind has power. Has power to reason, has power to decide. The human mind occupies a large place in human life as it determines all kinds of actions. So there's been an age-long battle for the mind. It didn't just start with you. God wants the human mind under his divine subjection to give us our minds. We must give to God our minds. It should be directed through the human spirit by the Holy Spirit to give God our minds through our spirit. Make our soul parts conform to the spirit of God that is within us. The devil wants to capture the human mind. Capture it. I mean, put it in jail. Capture it. He has so many ways of doing that. Because the mind of man is so important, it has been, and is, and always will be, a battlefield. Your mind is a battlefield. The mind suffers great onslaughts from the powers of darkness. More than any other part of you. The devil is shooting for your mind more than anything else that you have. This battle, this battle began in the Garden of Eden. It did not begin in the United States of America. In the Garden of Eden, Satan sought to conquer Eve. And Paul warns us not to be deceived as Eve was deceived by the devil's cunning thoughts. In 2 Corinthians 11 and 3, I fear, lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He let, he let them know that Eve was beguiled or deceived by the subtlety of the devil. And then he says 4,000 years later, your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of living an upright, clean, holy, pure spiritual life before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's been a raging battle from that garden until this beautiful day in which we're living today. The devil wants to take your mind and throw it into a limbo to where it doesn't function for God. He wants you to have a passive mind. What is a passive mind? In 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, if you, if you expect your sinner friends to understand you, you're going to miss it a long way. You expect your ungodly kinfolks to understand you, you're going to miss them too. It says the God of this world, who is the devil, he has blinded them which believe not. They don't understand. They don't see this thing. If you listen to them, you won't see it either. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. The devil wants minds to be blinded so they won't see Jesus. So they won't see salvation. So they won't understand the power of God. That's the sole purpose he has for blinding them. So the passive mind is a blinded mind. B, the passive mind is a reprobate. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are, are not convenient. 
You know, about once a week, you ought to read Romans chapter 1. It tells you how all the pagan nations came into existence, how the pagan religions came into existence. They are in direct rebellion against the Most High God and His truth. I don't care which one of them you belong to out there. Pagan religions are in rebellion against revealed knowledge of God. All you have to do is go back to the conception of them and see. When Buddha was mumbling around in the dark trying to find a way out, God was speaking through Isaiah and said, A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. I shall call his name Jesus. Yeah, God was in the business of revealing truth. and They were in the business of playing in the mud. Been there ever since. And you can do the same in your own life. God is revealing today how he wants to heal people, how he wants to bless people, how he wants to help people. You say, oh, no, I, I can't take that too literally. But that's from the devil. Amen. And you'll get what you believe. If you don't believe anything, you'll get nothing. If you believe for something, you'll get it. How many know that? Amen. We sure do believe it. The passive mind is a fleshly mind. Colossians 2.18, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility with the worshiping of angels, intruding to those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Th these are the areas the devil would like to bring us into, if he could, you know, away from the, having the mind of Christ. He wants to bring us into these type of things. He'd like to blind us what God wants to do today. I believe God wants to send the greatest revival this earth has ever known right now. <laughs> he just needs some vessels to put it in his all. He, he, he just needs some feet to carry it and some mouths to speak it. That's what he needs today. You say amen? amen? All right. God does not want us walking after the flesh and after the world. God does not want us walking after carnality. God wants us to walk in the spirit. When we walk in the spirit, we don't perform the lust of the flesh. We don't perform the lust of the flesh. We walk in the spirit. People that are walking in carnality are not walking in the spirit. God wants us to walk in humbleness and humility and kindness and peace and forgiveness. If you don't walk in it, you're walking in the flesh. The passive mind is a defiled mind. Titus 1.15, under the pure all things are pure, but under them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. The passive mind is a defiled mind. The passive mind is a carnal mind. In Romans 8 and 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The passive mind is a carnal mind, functioning and operating always in the, in the natural and normally in the, the sinful. The Christian must destroy the passive mind. Please get these. They're tremendous. Each one of them is worthy of a whole sermon. The Christian must destroy the passive mind. Number one, the empty mind. This I say, therefore, testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. The word vanity is empty. In the emptiness of their mind. An empty mind is one waiting for some external power to activate it. Spiritism demands an empty mind for it to function. The gurus demand an empty mind in order that you can let the devil function in there. The blank mind is a spiritual danger. A Christian must exercise his mind totally all the time, even when you sleep. You can command sweet dreams to come to you. Do you know that? You can demand those dirty dreams stay where they started from and stay away from you. He must think about God and his fellow man. He must fill his mind with truth, love, and the power of the Holy Ghost. We don't, we don't want empty minds. Don't ever let your mind go blank. Don't ever let it go empty. Occupy it with the Word of God. Can you say amen? All right. He, he says the inactive mind. Mental inactivity leads to mental laziness. And the mind should grow stronger as one grows older. God does not want mental inertia. Now, brother, I want to tell you one thing. Your, your, your body might grow old, but your mind has no business doing that. Your mind can be keener and smarter the longer you live until the day you go to heaven. When the mind ceases to create, say create. That's what I mean. You got to do something new every day. You got to do something you couldn't do the day before. When the mind ceases to comprehend and to apprehend, then that mind is not well. It is just not well. The mental process should never be under bondage. Never. It should always float free 
and the love of them and the power of God. An inactive mind desires to do things, but it never does them. Never. Worry can cause this type of inactivity. Fear can cause the mind to become weakened to where it cannot function properly. Fear is a monster. In Jesus' name, kill it. So is worry. <laughs> worry is the most useless thing you ever occupied yourself with. You get through, you got the same amount you started with. Nothing. The scattered mind. The devil interferes with a Christian's power of mental concentration. Now, you ought to work on this. This is worth an hour of your time. The devil interferes with a Christian's power of mental concentration. As some people are totally powerless to concentrate. To others, concentration is flighty. This creates inattentiveness and drifting minds. God demands, God demands through his word, full concentration. Are you here? Well, that's what I'm talking about, concentration. So I've told you before, people can walk out into the parking lot. Somebody walk up and say, what did the preacher say today? Oh, it was good, it was good. Well, good for what? It was good, it was good. Well, what did he say? Oh, it was good. <laughs> the devil's already taken take it away from you and you haven't crossed the parking lot yet. You should be able to say, point one, two, three, four. Bless God forever, I got it. Are you here? Yeah. That's making the word of God live live within your hearts. The forgetful mind is a D on page 11 of your, of your teaching syllabus. The forgetful mind. Now listen to this. There's some people who seem deprived of the power of memory and forget what they just heard, what they just heard just a few moments before. All unnatural loss of memory is an attack of the devil. Everybody get that? This causes our confidence and usefulness to be damaged. And we, we, we start saying, I'm getting old and my memory is bad. You've just confessed it. That's what you will get. You've just confessed it. And you just confessed a lie. Yes. If you forget something, don't know where it is, rebuke nobody but your own nose and go after your own self. And say, if you do that again, I'll wallop you one. And I don't mean maybe. Says, you stay on the ball as long as I live in here in that empty house. Anyway, all unnatural loss of memory is an attack to the devil. This causes our confidence in ourselves. You must never lose that. Sometimes a person with a fine memory sees it unexpectedly fail. This is an attack of the enemy to do with a passive mind. You don't want part of it. E, the vacillating mind. The devil would like for a person to take opposite views very quickly, just like the wind blowing, one side and then the other. The devil makes him generate one kind of thought and immediately shifts it to another kind of thought. Change my mind. Shifting admits the work of the adversary. The Bible speaks against double-mindedness, James 1 and 8. A double-minded man is unstable. A double-minded woman's the same too. Don't make a decision until you know you got the right one, and when you got it, stick with it. When I asked my wife to marry me, I said, now listen, you're as good as married. I don't go back on my word at all. Forget it. I'm yours now. It was that way, as you can see. Forty years of it. I've had people within two or three days of the getting married say, you think I'm doing the right thing? Wrong time to talk about that. <laughs> that was before you kissed her. You should have made up your mind on that problem. A vacillating mind is the devil's too, whether it's your mind or somebody else's. Preachers fall into this category and wonder why they're not blessed. There are preachers in this country, if they promise you they're going to be there on a certain date, you tremble until they get there because you don't know where they're coming or not. The very last hour, they may say, I'm not coming. I was in a conference in Tulsa, and, and, and in an hour's time, five people that was on that program canceled. All of them good Holy Ghost men, bless God. We'll have to meet God one day for a vacillating mind. God knows a year from now where I should be, and if I say I want to be there, God says, okay. I've got no right to tamper with that anymore. And if I do, it shows a weakness on my part. 
I tell every pastor in this whole country, when we tell you we'll be there, we're there. You better believe it. Get ready for us. You don't have to call back in and say, you still got your mind set on it? Are you here? Yeah. All right. The unrestrained mind. We got a lot of that. The devil liked to destroy the Christian's mind through causing you to never listen, just talk. And if anybody tells us something, you got one better. Just say, dear God, hurt and shut up so I can tell you mine's bigger than yours. <laughs> to have words that just drift through your brain like a wind on the sea. Some cannot restrain their tongue from gossiping. Just can't restrain it. If they're not gossiping, they're backbiting. They're not backbiting, they're joking. God says in Proverbs 10 and 19, in the multitude of words that wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. That's right. The torrent of words flowing out of a person leads to sin. The unrelaxed mind. Oh God, there's so many people that have problems with that. I have no problem with it at all. When I, when I find that I have a moment I can't sleep, I say, oh, thank God now I can get to work and get this laziness out of my bones. And I jump up and go to work, and the first thing you know, I'm so sleepy, I don't know what to do, because the devil hates to see anybody work, especially past midnight. He just can't stand it. Gives him a stomachache. <laughs> Psalm 127 and 2 says, he giveth his beloved sleep. How many believe that? And you can't sleep at night, thank God for it, and pray for all your friends and your enemies. Yeah, the devil lets you go to sleep in a hurry if you get like that. It's when you start shouting, counting sheep that don't belong to you. Yeah, he can keep you doing that a long time. He knows you're nutty. Anyway, the undisciplined mind. I wish I could go a lot deeper in these. The undisciplined mind, the mind without discipline. You, uh, you, you, just, you just, just, just ought to, ought to get a hold of that. That Philippians 4 and 8 is a tremendous scripture from God. What the Christian can do about the passive mind. We must bring every thought into captivity. In 2 Corinthians 10 and 3. That we will bring every thought into captivity. Into the obedience of Christ. Read that very carefully. We must put off the old man. Ephesians 4, 17. I say this therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as the nations walk. In the vanity of their minds. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance of them that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Put off that old nature, that old man. The renewed mind, verse 22 says that, that ye may put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the seed of lust. In verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And you'll see there, we must be reconciled in our minds. Colossians 1 21, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. We need a reconciled mind, reconciled to God, reconciled to our neighbors, reconciled to ourselves. The mind becomes active. 1 Peter 1, 13, gird up the loins of your mind. The mind becomes powerful. I don't think maybe any human knows how powerful it could be if you really got a hold of it and begin to make it work. Has powers of concentration to do what it wants to do. It becomes a yielded mind, the human spirit, which is yielded to the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2, 16 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? We have, we have the mind of Christ. If you would spend a number of hours with this lesson that we have just open up the lid for it just a little bit. It'll change your destiny. It'll change your life. It'll change your home. It'll change your job. It's very possible that the fullness of the human mind has never been used on the face of this earth. For God or for ourselves, it's time to use it in Jesus' name. No computer that man will ever make will have the power of the human mind that God placed within us. Use it for the kingdom. Can you say amen? amen? We thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the honor of talking to this satellite Bible class across this nation of ours and in the great metropolis of Indianapolis where there are 
100,000 people joining this class and loving it. In southern Michigan and northern Indiana with tens of thousands of people. We say thank you for the honor and the privilege. And don't let them think that we're going to make things easy on them. We don't believe in that at all. We believe in teaching the truth just like it is and for them to accept it like it is. So, Lord, we ask you right now to reach your arms of mighty power out and touch our minds.